morning uh, or good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much for being here. You know, it, we, we recognize that we don't have a sort of sold out crowd, but maybe the appropriate analogy here is when you fly on the airplane and you're so excited when there's nobody sitting next to you, you think you can get a little more comfortable, maybe you can lay down. So if you feel like you need to do any of those things, rest assured you have room to do it. Um, so, um, hi, and thank you very much for attending our session this afternoon. Um, I, I hope that you enjoy it and get a lot out of it. Uh, we especially want to thank Barbara Snyder and Mark Behrens for giving us the opportunity to put this panel together. Uh, my name is Lindsay Page. I'm from the University of Pittsburgh, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you and uh, introducing our panel today. Um, so our panel today um, focuses on a set of talks on innovations in access to and success in college. Um, I'm going to provide you a very quick roadmap for our presentation and then turn it over quickly because there's a lot of ground that we're hoping to cover. Uh, so in our session today, uh, we'll have four research and policy presentations uh, that really zero in on different touch points and issues uh, in students' college-going trajectories. So first, Bridget Terry Long will be talking about using information and assistance to increase college savings and enrollment. Uh, following Bridget, Sandy Baum will be giving a talk about redesigning the Pell Grant program. Uh, following that, uh, Ben Castleman and I will be presenting on strategies for uh, mitigating summer melt, which basically means improving the transition from high school graduation to college enrollment among the kids who really intend to go to college. Uh, and finally, uh, our last research presentation, uh, we'll hear from Tom Bailey, who will be looking at kids once they actually matriculate to college, and he'll be talking about redesigning college programs to really support student success in college. Um, so while, while these talks really touch on different points in students' college-going trajectories, as we, as we talked about the things that we were going to present, we really noticed several common themes. And so I just want to bring those themes to the forefront now, and you'll hear those reverberate through the presentations today. So first, the need to simplify information for students, the need to simplify complex processes, uh, the benefit of reaching out to students proactively and simplifying the process of obtaining support, uh, to navigate the complex landscape of college going. Um, after the research presentations, we'll hear from Jack Buckley from the College Board, who will provide some thoughts on these uh, research presentations and also talk specifically from the vantage of the College Board about initiatives that they have underway to support student access and success in college. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bridget. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, so happy to have you here. I know this room is, is so large, but um, still we see so many wonderful faces. So as Lindsay just introduced, we're going to be talking about innovations in access and success. And I'm focusing on a couple of research projects I've done, uh, looking at the use of information and assistance to try to help improve student outcomes. But to ground us, uh, I've been given a little extra time to provide some background for all of the presentations. Um, I think we all know um, that there are gaps in terms of all kinds of educational outcomes. This is showing enrollment rates of high school graduates into college um, over the period of 1975 to 2010. Uh, and what you can see is, first of all, we do have more students who are going to college than ever before, but there are differences by income. The green line is the top 20% or high income students. The blue line is the bottom 20%. And what you can see is there's a gap, even if you go back to 1975, that persists even today. And even though we have the Pell Grant, we have all kinds of other um, federal, state, institutional financial aid programs, all different kinds of um, policies that try to address academic preparation, information, and so forth, we still have this persistent gap. Uh, so yes, the problem is that we have these large gaps, not only in enrollment, as I just showed you in the previous chart, but also persistence um, and completion by income and race. Um, and there are major barriers, affordability and preparation being two, um, but also common among both of those are the complex processes of knowing what to study when, um, how to fill out financial aid forms in order to be able to get financial aid. And so in order to get to college, you have to process a lot of complicated information and do the right things at the right time at the right order. Uh, so even if you look at the decision pipeline, this is just kind of a snapshot if you think about um, taking a traditional high school student going through trying to get to college, there's so many little decisions that they have to make and hurdles they have to cross all throughout high school. So you need to do these things in the right order at the right time. 
And even something like taking the SAT or the ACT has multiple steps from whether or not you're going to get fee waivers, registering, preparing, showing up, and all kinds of other things there. So we have a very complicated process, and the consequences, as we're learning more and more, um, are quite dire if you make a poor decision. You know, higher education is an ins expensive investment, and while uh, it is beneficial for most students, the returns do vary depending on where you go, what degree, what your major is, and so forth. And it can be very risky that some schools have very low graduation rates or high loan default rates. Um, and so we worry a great deal about students increasingly making poor decisions. So the question of whether or not timely, simple information could help improve um, outcomes is one that many have, have started to focus on. If you think about it, using information might actually be cheaper than some of the other kinds of policy initiatives that we debate. Um, obviously cheaper than creating a new financial aid program. Um, and using better information might actually improve the effectiveness of programs that we currently have. It also might be easy to replicate at scale. Many of us as researchers can demonstrate that something happens in one particular school district or one particular school, um, but then you have trouble thinking about how do you scale this up. And with information, it's still a problem and there's considerations you want to make, but it might be much easier to think about replicating something at a much larger level um, than some of the inter other interventions. We also know the public wants more information, and there have been efforts. There's been this recognition that students, parents, teachers, counselors don't have enough information. But unfortunately, a lot of the early um, initiatives have been, let's flood the market with information. Tons and tons and tons of information. So you can go to the Department of, of Education website and look at the College Navigator, and it'll give you 300 pieces of information about any college. But the feeling is, okay, maybe that may be too much. We may have crossed over to the other extreme, and we need to think about how can we, what are simplified ways um, or ways we could help prioritize information for families to match them with their goals. Um, but we do know that using information has worked in other settings, um, whether it be school choice and school report cards or health care decisions or retirement options, things like that. We have seen information work in other, other venues. So there might be some promise that this could also work for other problems in education. So the question is, when is information, when can information work? When is information not enough? And when might something else also be necessary? So to talk about two of my projects, the first one, um, the FAFSA experiment, is some work I did um, with some co-authors, Eric Bettinger, Phil Oriapoulos, and uh, Lisa Sambumatsu, um, several years ago, where we were helping families fill out their financial aid forms. Um, we were working with families who went to H&R Block's offices and were filling out their taxes as they normally would. Um, and then we built software kind of behind the scenes that would take that tax information and pre-populate the FAFSA. So if it was a randomized controlled trial and if you were in the treatment group, uh, the, your tax information pre-populated the FAFSA. We had a very streamlined, simplified protocol to get the rest of the information. So we completed the FAFSA or this federal financial aid form um, and we would submit it directly to the Department of Education if you gave us permission to do so. We also gave individualized information about this is how much aid you can expect. Here are some prices of local colleges so you can get a sense of what your net prices might be. Really, you know, using information to kind of streamline and um, personalize things for them. Now, we spent on average about eight minutes with families, and this included going through consent protocols and collecting background baseline information. So eight minutes, and we did give them a $20 gift card for their time. But the question of whether or not eight minutes and a $20 gift card can make, uh, have an impact. And what we found is helping families get over that hurdle of the financial aid application really did have a huge impact on enrollment. So among the graduating high school seniors, we increased enrollment by seven percentage points, um, actually about 30-35 percent among that group, just by getting them over that information barrier of the form. And when we continued to track them, we realized it's not just getting people in college, but these were people who were actually persisting, um, that they were eight percentage points more likely to still be enrolled or to be enrolled two uh, consecutive years, um, and we continued to track them. So we're seeing these are not students who couldn't perform in higher education. They just didn't, couldn't get over that information barrier. And so giving them information and a little bit of assistance had huge effects. Um, and so the lesson being simplification and assistance can improve outcomes greatly. Like I said, we've seen this in other fields as well. Another project that I've been working on that um, I'm getting very close to having results to, to share, actually I'll be showing you some preliminary results in just a second, is the question of why don't families save more for college? Um, and similarly, it's an issue where there's very low levels of awareness about even the cost of higher education, the need for family savings, what their options are, what the benefits might be. 
There's also misperceptions among many families that if they save, then they're not going to get financial aid, which isn't true. Um, the savings plans are very complex. They're these very complicated application forms with very, very small print using all these financial terms that lots of families don't know about. And this is also something where, you know, you have a newborn baby and you say, oh, I need to open this college fund, but oh, I've got more time. And then you wait and you procrastinate. And particularly we know from behavioral economics, the more complex a, a task is, the more likely that someone's just going to procrastinate rather than actually um, doing it. It also may just be the case that this policy is not, a, not one that we really want to put a lot of emphasis on, and it's been a question of whether or not families, particularly low-income families, have enough disposable income to actually make a difference in terms of savings. So it was in, our, in this project, we were kind of testing how much um, is this a good policy, um, along with lots of other ones that we have in terms of improving college access. So the early college planning initiative, um, work I'm doing with Eric Bettinger, we had three groups, a control group that just got an informational workshop, um, and these are the uh, parents of 7th to 10th graders, about things you should think about to prepare both academically, courses and so forth, as well as financially for college. There was a treatment group who got that same informational workshop plus some assistance with the form, the 529 form is a saving form, and the last group um, also got an opening deposit. Or another way to think about this is the control group just got information alone, and as you'll see, that was basically the same thing as doing nothing. Um, the treatment group, the first treatment group, got a simplified process where we really broke down and said, these are the eight steps to filling out the form, and we'll sit down with you and fill out the application to open a college savings account. And then the third group also got a small incentive where we gave you the $50 that would be needed to first open an account, um, and then the account is yours, and you can decide what you want to do with it. So just to give you a sense of the preliminary results of a sample of about 1,000 families, again, a randomized controlled trial. For the control group, just giving the information, this form is so complicated, it was, almost no one um, actually opened an account just from going to a workshop, us giving them the application and saying, goodbye, good luck. The second group, where we actually sat down with them and would fill out the form with them and get as far as they wanted, and then they could take it home and decide for themselves whether or not they wanted to go ahead and open the account, almost no one did. But that last group, over a third of those families, if we sat down with them and said, we'll give you the 50 bucks to just open the account, about a third, or almost 36% of them went ahead and decided to open the 529 accounts. And this is ongoing work, and we'll continue to track and see what happens to them. But one thing we've noticed even early on is these families in that, uh, who do open accounts, um, many of them, about a third of them, are also signing up for automatic monthly contributions. And this is something that is encouraged where you can, um, as low as $15 a month, automatically come out of your account and go into your college savings account. And this is what lots of people say, you know, this small, um, small amounts over a period of time can really make a dent. And this was kind of the surprising finding, that once we got them over that initial hurdle, this really complicated application form, and then they started getting these quarterly um, statements from Fidelity, who's the one who manage, uh, manages the five. 29 accounts in and, and Massachusetts, they started to engage themselves. They started to be more proactive themselves. It's much easier to send in additional deposits, and we also do see that behavior. But this is an instance where information alone didn't quite get them over that hurdle. But once we got them past um, you know, opening the account, then things became much more simple. And even though we didn't talk to them again, we didn't give them any other pressures or any other information, they were able to engage in the system them themselves. So to kind of summarize some other lessons um, we're seeing from the literature, information is great, but it's not always enough. Um, so here's an example again where, you know, information alone is not going to get students and families over really complex barriers. Um, it may only be that information alone is only good for really simple tasks, really straightforward tasks. Um, but another thing that comes out of the work is proactive outreach is absolutely necessary. So for both of these projects, it wasn't put it up on a website and then the family has to find it and use the information. It's about going out into communities where parents are, where they work, where they're doing other kinds of things, and trying to give them information there and help it be useful um, to them. Um, so three ways to think about how we might go forward in terms of policy, whether federal, or state, or even what we do as, as institutions, you know, option number one is to change the overall infrastructure to make the whole process simpler. 
So we could, and there have been efforts since our original FAFSA study to simplify the FAFSA to have fewer questions. And if you do it online, there's skip logic and things like that to have the um, data from the Treasury come and pre-populate part of the form. So that's one thing. Another thing states have done when we know that students, if you want to go to a four-year institution, have to take an SAT or ACT is it's part of their um, a student evaluation. So everyone in the school takes it. Registration happens at the school. The students take it at their school that sort of thing. So it's reducing a barrier or things that families and students have to do. So we could change the system, the infrastructure um, altogether. Second option is to use personalized information to try to simplify the process and options provided. Um, so we do have all this great deal of information. Are there ways, uh, given how we know other things about families, we could help target what we send them. Um, so one example would be to create tools where students put in just a couple pieces of information about family background or interests and then we send to them here a list of schools or options or financial aid that might be available to you or the fact that we have all these government dependency programs where with other agencies families are submitting lots of data to demonstrate the fact that they're low income and they're eligible for benefits. Could we use that information to automatically say you're eligible for a Pell Grant? Why do we make you give that information twice. So thinking about ways that we get other information from families um, to personalize the things that we're doing um, that they might qualify for or the information that we're sending them. And then option number three, that there are some barriers that are so high that haven't been changed yet or things that are very personalized where assistance is going to be necessary. And whether that's one-on-one -on -one assistance or group assistance or peer assistance or using technology um, and, and ways to help give um, families assistance because these are often kind of conversations and give and takes and back and forth, um, to think about what set of problems we can't just streamline and they're going to go away, but we want to invest and direct our resources to try to attack, to attack them um, by using all the many people in the community um, who are trying to address that problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This, it's really strange. I mean, there really are a lot of people in this room, actually, but it, it doesn't feel that way. Um, so building on some of the ideas that Bridget raised, I'm going to talk about some ideas for reforming the Pell Grant program. And the first thing is that even just the idea of reforming the Pell Grant program can um, lead to some resistance because the Pell Grant program is really the foundation of how the federal government takes responsibility for I was going to say assuring, but not assuring, but for, for taking some reasonable steps towards making sure that low-income students have at least a starting point for paying for college. And this is critically important, and I think, you know, we probably don't have to debate the importance of that here, but people, many people don't want to touch it because it is so important. And... Um, a couple of years ago, I mean, I really started thinking about this actually before the big run-up in cost of the Pell Grant program, and I led a, um, a study group through, under the auspices of the College Board and with funding from the Gates and Lumina Foundations uh, to get a group of people together and sit and just think about if we could really improve the Pell Grant program, what would we do? And Tom and Bridget were, were part of that group. And then after we finished that, uh, Judy Scott Clayton and I, she was also a member of the group, wrote uh, this paper that I'm going to talk about for the Hamilton Project at Brookings, where we built on some of the ideas that had come about. So we really spent sort of a few years thinking, what could we do to improve the Pell Grant program? And our motivation for improving the Pell Grant program is very much how do we incorporate some of the understanding of some of the issues that Bridget was talking about in terms of simplification and information, some of what Tom is going to talk about, about how, you, how, how students can actually get through college. How can we make sure that the program is really functioning as well for students as it should? And uh, there's evidence that actually it's not functioning as well as it should. I mean, one issue is that when we think about Pell Grants, most people think about students from young people from low-income families who grow up in environments where they don't think they're going to have the money to go to college, and we need to assure them that they will, and we need to help them to pay for college. And what we do is we give them a voucher. We just hand them the money, and we say, this way you have money, like anybody whose parents would give them money. You have the money. Go figure it out and get a college education. But the reality is that the Pell Grant program is much, much more than just a program to help 
young people from low-income families go to college, it's also a major source of workforce training. So uh, almost half of the Pell Grant program is for older adults who are going back to school in order to find more, um, to find better opportunities in the labor force. And so thinking about what people need in these different ways seems really important. And the reality is that Many students are, one, not applying for and accessing Pell Grants in the first place, and two, even when they get Pell Grants and they go to school, they're not succeeding. So many people are taking Pell Grants and student loans and starting out and not getting through. And we think that a responsible program needs to take all of these things into consideration. If you look at completion rates uh, for students, uh, there's just a huge difference in what students at different life stages are doing. So uh, if you look at students who started in 2003-04 who were 24 years old or younger when they started school, about a quarter of them ended up six years later with a bachelor's degree. But for those who started at age 25 or older, almost no one got a bachelor's degree. And this is not that they failed in getting a bachelor's degree. Some of them, of course, had hoped to get a bachelor's degree and then either realized that it wasn't the right path for them or, or just didn't succeed in it. But um, a lot of them are getting certificates or shorter term degrees. But two thirds of them are leaving school without a credential. A program that just hands them money and says, go figure it out yourself, and then shrugs when they don't figure it out doesn't seem to us like the best use of, of our money. And we really have to recognize that this idea of what going to college means, it's just, it's not like all these 18 year olds going off to live in dormitories on, on college campuses. About 60% of the Pell Grant recipients are enrolled either in community colleges or in for-profit institutions, and a full quarter of them are older than 30 years old. So we're really, uh, you know, doing more than one thing with this program. We have to be aware of what has happened to the funding. It used to be that Pell could sort of go under the radar screen, but from a $15 billion program in 2002-03, that's in 2012 dollars, in 2012-13 it became a $32 billion program with almost 9 million recipients. Actually, 2012-13 was down a little bit from a peak in 2011-12. So we now have a big program that Paul Ryan has just proposed freezing for 10 years. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that's what the conversation should be about. But I also don't think the other end of that conversation is people saying, oh, well, it's leveled off. There's not going to be a shortfall in funding next year. Let's not worry about changing the program. What I'm thinking about is not how much money are we spending. Are we spending? It's how are we spending that money? Whatever money we spend, and I think we could afford to spend more as a society on this, we should spend it as effectively as possible to change the lives of as many students as possible. We should recognize that this is not just a program to develop general human capital. It's also a program for specific workforce skills, but it's not only that, and much of the conversation these days about what makes education worth it focuses only on workforce skills as opposed to educating people. So, so we need to make sure that, that it does both of those things. So we really need to think of this as, I think, sort of different functions. If you look at what recent high school graduates, what we're doing with recent high school graduates, we are saying that some people grow up in circumstances where they don't have the same opportunities as other people. We want to improve their opportunities. We want to improve access to higher education and try to reduce some of that gap that Bridget was talking about. But for older students, it's really different. Whoever you are, if you are an adult and you are not, you don't have whatever skills are necessary for you to succeed in the labor market, we need to help you to get those skills. And we're providing, in a way, a form of social insurance for people to make sure that they have access to the resources to improve their labor market skills. And these are related but not identical functions that the Pell Grant program has to fill. So we really thought about what could we do to improve the program in these ways. And we came up with some, some quite specific ideas, and I'm not going to go into all the details of the ideas, but I want to just give you an idea of the directions that we think would be constructive, and we're open to lots of conversation about this. First of all, it has to be simpler. 
It just can't be that you have to fill out this complicated form and that you have to fill it out every year. But what we propose is that when people turn 17 or maybe it's 16, we automatically determine Pell Grant eligibility for everyone of that age. You shouldn't even have to do anything. We know enough about you through the income tax system, through other means-tested programs. Let's figure that out. That's your Pell Grant eligibility. And it's good every year until you're 24 years old, could be 25, 23, you can have a Pell Grant. And we're going to tell you that. And we're going to tell you that so that when you make your decision about going to college, you will know that this money is sitting there and you're going to lose it if you don't go to college. And you know how much it's going to be. And then you don't have to reapply for it every year. That way, people would know about it, and it would be simpler. And for older students, we also want it to be a simpler process. You'd have to reapply again as an adult. But if once you're an adult, if you apply to a program, there's your Pell Grant. You're going to get that money every year without reapplying for it. And that would make the program much more simple, and, and there would be advanced knowledge of it. But a key thing that we need to do is we need to give people more guidance. And we need to think about how to help high school students make better decisions about post-secondary options. But in particular, we need to think about adults who are out there who don't even have lousy high school counselors or, and, and are not going to school with other people at this point who are making this sort of decision. And we really need to think about a, how to help them get the information that they need to make good decisions. And it's not enough just to say when you take your Pell Grant to a particular institution, you know, you'll get guidance on that campus, as some campuses would suggest, because you, of course, have to choose the campus. And many campuses have great incentive to get you to enroll at their institution, and they may have particular incentives to get you to enroll in particular programs. So particularly for adults who are already in the labor force and are seeking other skills, that needs to be a third party. Before you go sign up at the school that you saw advertised on the bus while you were riding to work, and they say to you, this will be great, sign on the dotted line, you need a disinterested person who can talk to you personally and can help you decide what the best path for you is and make sure that you're going to come out with skills that will help you in your local labor market to be employed. I'm not going to say to be gainfully employed because that's a loaded term, but that, that is what I mean. So we need to figure out how to do this. I think a lot of it could be done online, uh, for, particularly for younger students. There are lots of things we could do, but we're not just, again, talking about put more information out there. There is lots of information out there. But students know, don't know how to make the decisions that are right for themselves. And we really believe that it would be worth putting some money into this even if it means that the Pell Grant is $100 or $200 smaller than otherwise, that $200 could make more difference in a student's life if what it does is, is link them to appropriate training. Now, we haven't designed that training program, and we think there needs to be good experimentation and rigorous study of, of different approaches to providing that guidance before we you know, write the law about it. But another way of making sure that the Pell Grant program supports completion is to think about how we al allocate Pell Grants along the way. And, and this is a very politically loaded issue, but right now we define full-time students as students enrolled for 12 credit hours. And we're very surprised that all these Pell Grant recipients are enrolled for 12 credit hours a semester, and it takes them five years to earn a bachelor's degree if they get to that point. You know, it's very simple math to figure out it's going to take them five years. But what we could do is we could say, this is the amount of Pell Grant money you have to complete a bachelor's degree. Okay, maybe you're not going to do it in 120 credit hours attempted, maybe it's 150. But this is what you have. Take them at your own pace. And if you take courses over the summer in addition to going full-time both semesters, of course you should be funded to do that. But if you take 15 credits, you should get more money than if you take 12. At many institutions, you have to pay more tuition, and we should be giving people more money. We don't even have to tell them. Full-time doesn't need to be a terminology here. Just give people money to take the courses that they need to take in order to get their degrees. And I think it's possible. There's actually some legislation that would move in that direction. But, but if we can just get people to think about how to structure the program so it supports success, we think that will be a very, very helpful thing to do. And we think that we should try these things and gain evidence about them. And what we really need to do is encourage a conversation that says Pell is a terrifically important program, but we can't just throw money at people. We have to give people money along with a structure and guidance that will help them to make good decisions. Thank you. Just 
just uh, getting through the rest of Sandy's slides. I feel like uh, Ellen at the Oscars, that in a room like this I should snap a selfie uh, to send to my wife. But I think in the interest of time, I will just proceed. My name is Ben Castleman with Lindsay Page. I will be presenting uh, our research on addressing summer melt among college attending low-income high school graduates. At least the first part of our presentation, then turning over to Lindsay to finish. I do want to acknowledge that this work over the last several years has been supported by numerous funders. None of the work would have been possible without them, while any errors are simply uh, Lindsay and mine in creation. So the term summer melt is one that has been used for some time by college admissions officers to refer to the tendency of students who have been accepted to a college and, and paid a deposit to enroll at that institution to instead matriculate at a different institution, usually presumed to be of peer quality. So you could think of a student coming, uh, depositing at University of Virginia, but instead matriculating at Wake Forest or Duke or something like that. We're going to use summer melt to refer to a very different phenomenon. When students who have been accepted to college, in many cases have applied for financial aid, they've even chosen where to go as of the end of high school, but fail to enroll anywhere in the year following high school graduation. Up until a few years ago, the summer after high school was really largely overlooked as an important time period in students' transition from high school to college. But as we show on this map, drawing on data that we and our colleagues have collected uh, over the past several years, summer melt happens across the country and at surprisingly high rates. So you can see in Boston, Massachusetts, in Fulton County, Georgia, one in five college attending high school graduates who, again, has done everything they're supposed to. They've been accepted, they've applied for aid, they've chosen where to go, they've graduated from high school. One in five of those students doesn't enroll anywhere. In places like Dallas and right here in Philadelphia, it's closer to one out of every three students. So an important question, of course, is why do students melt? And the fact is that even after being accepted to college and choosing where to enroll, students face a set of complex and often unanticipated tasks that they have to complete in order to matriculate. Many of these tasks relate to financial aid or the cost of college. So we find, for instance, in our research that a surprising share of students come into the summer having not received their financial aid packages from the colleges to which they've applied, often because they're unaware they've been flagged by the United States Department of Education to verify the income and asset information they provided on their federal financial aid application. Another issue is that students are often surprised by fees associated with required tasks that they have to complete. So something like a housing application, a student might not be anticipating that they have to pay $50 for that application to be processed. And that doesn't sound like a lot of money compared to the cost of college, but for a lot of the families who we've talked to in our research, that $50, if it's unanticipated, can be hard to come up with and can prevent the student from getting that application in and, uh, and getting on-campus housing. We also find that students are often confused by fairly simple but procedural and bureaucratic tasks that they need to complete in order to matriculate. So that might be registering for orientation, register for, registering for and completing academic placement tests, dealing with their health insurance. And I think one of the big challenges with these tasks is that they arise during a time in students' educational trajectories where they typically have little access to professional guidance or support. So they're no longer part of their high school, and unfortunately, school counselors typically don't work over the summer. They've yet to engage with the supports that are available on their college campus. And if they're the first in their family to go to college, their parents may want to help them and not know how, or face very real comp uh, competing pressures with their child going off to college, like foregone income or foregone help with childcare. So over the past several summers, we've designed and evaluated uh, through randomized controlled trials a series of interventions to help students successfully navigate the transition from high school to college. In uh, a series of interventions over several summers, we had high school counselors or community-based financial aid advisors reach out to students to offer individualized help with completing the, these required tasks. And an important point here is you should not think of this as a five-week, 40-hour-a-week summer bridge program. This is two to three hours of support per student from a school counselor, helping them interpret their award letter, seek out additional sources of aid, deal with these procedural tasks. So fairly light touch. In a subsequent summer, um, we 
uh, hired peer mentors who were thriving in college, who had graduated from the same communities as these students, to reach out and offer support. But I think as importantly, first-hand perspective, advice, and encouragement, not only on getting through the summer, but also on succeeding in college. In that same summer, we facilitated a partnership between a large urban school district and the university attended by the majority of students from that district so that we could investigate how students were responsive to outreach from the high school side versus the college side. And in a final set of interventions that has spanned uh, two summers, four states, and over 10 districts, we've investigated personalized and automated text messaging as a low-cost and scalable strategy to get students personalized and simplified information about tasks they need to complete and also allow them to connect with a school counselor or, or financial aid professional when they need assistance. And this text messaging work, what it involved was collecting some information um, from students their name, their cell phone number, where they were planning to go to college, information from college websites, when orientation uh, had to be registered for or where a student could go to placement exams, piecing all of that together into an automated system and then sending out 10 messages over the course of the summer months that reminded students about these tasks, that included web links so that if a student had a smartphone, which we find a lot of students um, across the socioeconomic spectrum do, um, students could complete these tasks in the moment right from their phone and the messages made it really easy for a student to connect with a school counselor. Rather than having to pick up the phone or go into a school, they could simply write back and request a meeting with the counselor. And I think these interventions really speak to a lot of the same themes that Bridget and Sandy described in their talk. Helping students navigate complex processes, delivering personalized and simplified information at timely points in students' trajectories, and mi really minimizing barriers to students getting access to professional help. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, who will share the results of what we found, um, and we'll also talk about how we're expanding these strategies to other points in students' trajectories. Uh, so as Ben mentioned, uh, one of the first interventions that we conducted was a, a counselor-based intervention. And um, as he noted, we studied this through the context of a randomized controlled trial. And so to be quite clear, all of the students in the interventions received information at the start of the summer to say, your counselors are here to help you with summer tasks should you need help. Uh, so there was never a, a moment where a student who, who was in the control group was denied access to support. But what we found was that even though students were prompted, students in the control group were prompted to come and get support if they needed it over the summer, virtually no student did. Uh, whereas for students in the control group, uh, these students received proactive and regular um, outreach uh, from counselors throughout the summer months. Uh, and in our treatment groups, about half to 75% of students had at least one substantive interaction with a counselor over the summer months. And so what we find um, in the graph that I show here, uh, we show uh, in the blue bars, students in the treatment group, in the orange bars, students in the control group, and we look at outcomes at three different time points. Initial enrollment in college, in the fall after high school graduation, first year persistence, and second year persistence. And what we see is that uh, we, we obtain positive impacts on timely enrollment, and almost more importantly than, than that initial impact, we see that that, that impact persists and, and perhaps grows a little bit stronger. Maybe we're giving students a smarter start to college. And we think that this persistence is uh, particularly important because if what we were doing was tipping students into college only to have them take on debt and drop out very soon after, then arguably we wouldn't be doing a good, uh, we would be doing students a disservice. Uh, but we see that their success, they're able to be successful in college once they enroll. Um, as we, oh, one other thing that I wanted to note here uh, that isn't illustrated in the, in the graphic, uh, but that we found in the data when we disaggregated, was that these impacts were particularly strong for the lowest income students in our samples. And that's, that's an impact that we, would, that we would expect, and in fact, it, it bore out in the data. Uh, when we look at our text message and peer mentor interventions, we see something similar. Here, the structure of the graph that I'm showing you is a little bit different. Here we see impacts uh, for Boston, Massachusetts, Lawrence and Springfield, and for Dallas, Texas, particularly for low-income students in Dallas. 
And, and what we find here is a little more heterogeneity in our effects. We find that um, impacts are, are strongest and statistically significant in the sites where it, it seems to us that students have fewer uh, college-going supports. And so uh, this may be particularly beneficial for, for students who didn't have supports in, in the college-going process all along. Uh, uh, along that same line of reasoning, um, one other thing that we find is that uh, these kinds of interventions were, we found to be particularly impactful uh, for students who had GPAs that would suggest that they were college ready, but they weren't necessarily the highest flyers in their school. Maybe they flew under the, the radar of college going supports in their, in their high schools. But again, we found uh, impacts of things like the very low cost, about $7 per student, text-based outreach and peer mentor outreach in terms of timely enrollment for students in college. Um, while this work uh, was um, primarily quantitative in nature, um, we engaged, uh, after the, the positive results from these studies, we engaged in more of a qualitative exploration, actually, to understand uh, very deeply the experiences of students and the counselors who support them. And um, this, this work um, altogether culminated in a, this is like a shameless self-promotion, right? But in a, in a, a book project um, that, that Ben and I engaged in, um, and I just wanted to share a, a quick excerpt um, that, that really exemplifies the experience of a student and a stumbling block that uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect. Shanice's experiences exemplify the point that because their circumstances often are less straightforward, the college-going steps required of low-income students can in turn be more complex. Early in her high school career, Shanice became informally estranged from her parents. Though her parents moved to a neighboring state, she maintained her residency and continued to attend the same high school through the support of friends and other relatives. Shanice earned acceptance to the state flagship university, yet because she was still legally a dependent of her parents and they lived in a different state, the university charged her the out-of-state rate for tuition, nearly twice that for in-state students. The ironic truth was that she had never actually been outside of the state. Shanice didn't know what she could possibly do in order to afford attending college. Uh, so this was a story that a counselor shared with us of, of a real student's experience. And luckily, this was a student who had the support of a counselor. But what our aggregate results suggest is that there are many, many students who don't have the support to help them overcome these kinds of unexpected hurdles. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to note is that based on the, the promise of some of this work in terms of providing students with proactive outreach, often low-touch, low-cost outreach, we're thinking about how to use that kind of strategy at other time points in students' college-going trajectories. Uh, so, so we're investigating how to provide students with personalized prompts to complete steps like uh, filling out their FAFSA, making sure that they've completed their FAFSA properly, and that they get through the process of income verification. Uh, in, in terms of, in the realm of, of summer melt and the transition to college, uh, we're continuing to do work in that area, for example, exploring the relative benefits, um, really a head-to-head -head comparison of this personal outreach from a counselor versus personalized outreach via text messaging. Uh, and finally, on the persistence and success, thinking about how we can nudge students along once they're in college uh, in order to improve outcomes. So, for example, uh, we worked with a college access organization to continue to um, message students once they had enrolled in college uh, to remind them to renew their FAFSAs because often, oftentimes students miss that step. And we found that this um, kind of very low-cost nudge was, was, again, particularly beneficial for students who uh, were community college-going students who likely were not getting that kind of nudge from their own institution. Uh, so thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom, um, who will talk about um, how we can better support students once they're actually in college. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yes, this is, uh, we're, we're continuing the progression here. Um, for the last several years uh, at the Community College Research Center, we've been trying to figure out why students, uh, so few students actually finish community colleges and figure out what, what to do about that. And, uh, you know, much of the research that, that we've done and others as well, Bridget's done important work on this, has looked at the remediation at, uh, and sort of thought about, well, students come in with very weak uh, skills and so what do we do about that? That's a problem. 
Uh, but in the last few years, we have been focused uh, thinking more about the complexity of the institution. I mean, students come into these institutions, and they're really very complex. Uh, and what implications does that have? So um, also remember that it's interesting to think about the summer melt problem, because many of these stu students didn't apply to college, didn't think about which one to go to, didn't choose a college, and show up at registration in September expecting to register and to, so, so we're talking about a dimension of lack of knowledge and preparation that's, that's really greater than that. So this is actually, to start out with the problem of, of, of remediation, uh, about 20% 20, about 20 of community college students are referred to three levels of math remediation. That is, they're presumably they have to take three semesters of math before they're ready for college. And so you think they move through this progression, and in fact, we traced students through this, and you see all the possible ways of moving through these courses students actually do. They go take all three, they take one and they skip, they go backwards. So this is just a, to, to answer add to the fact that many students arrive and they don't realize they need to, they'll take an assessment, they're put in remediation, they don't understand the difference between that and actually college level courses. So most of these students, and a majority of students are in remediation, start out already in kind of a, a, a highly confusing area. Now, this is, um, we, we took students, uh, 14,425 first time in college students in five colleges, five community colleges in one state. And we traced their pathways. Now, this diagram actually shows you, if you, you think, a normal path through college, you'd think, in a community college, is you'd take full time, two semesters, you take the summer off, and then you take two more semesters, and you graduate. So actually, it turns out that of these 14,000 students, 175 of them took that path, which I imagine many of us, when we went through our four years, we actually did that. Um, the, the, the bars at the top go back to Sandy's point that, that full-time is 12 credits, so even if you go full-time in that definition, you can't finish in four semesters. So you might take a few courses over the summer, and so let's call that a normal pathway. So that, add, that adds another 50 students. So you have 250 out of 14,000 students who take what we normally would be considered kind of a standard pathway. Now this diagram actually is a, there's a row in this diagram for all 14,000 students. The blank areas show where they're actually not enrolled, and those purple dots shows the first time they enroll in a four-year college. So you can think about this or just kind of gaze at it a little bit, and you see the incredible diversity of pathways that students take through college. And very few of them do what it is we think we have designed college to do. That's almost non-existent. So what do we do about that? This is, this is a, we actually went to a college and we tried to see what students thought they were doing. And this just shows for these different age students that most students, when they come in, are either in general studies. These are community college students. And that, what that really means is, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to transfer. And especially if I need a Pell Grant, I have to be in a program. So I'm in general studies, or they're undeclared. <coughs> You can see the older students, I don't know, my, our, our hypothesis is the older students may be not aware they can get financial aid or perhaps aren't eligible for it, so they don't bother to put themselves into general studies. They just say that they're undeclared. So this is a picture of what, what students think they're doing when they come into college. Right? They have no, generally, they have no idea. They're not in a program. They're not thinking about which program to be in and don't really know how to do that. Okay, so... <clears throat> Speaking of complexity, uh, in general, the, the, the counseling or advising system in community colleges is based on one-on-one -on -one counseling. And so you, that generally means 10 or 15 minutes. And with the help of those 10 or 15 minutes, and with this, the students can choose their program. So you can see that uh, that wouldn't be such an easy task to do. Um, this is recommended courses to study transfer into various majors, once again. So also, there's something else, which is most of those students don't know what they want to do. So they sit down for 10 minutes, and they're handed this extremely complicated thing, which is difficult to understand, and yet they don't know what they want to do. So once again, I, I, if you're professors, you probably, a student comes into your course, and you, they don't know what they want to do. They come in for advising, and you say, well, why don't you knock off some, some sort of electives, so at least 
they can go forward. So that's what happens with students. Our students tend to be you know, highly informed and kind of know what they're doing. We hope that's not true for these students. All right, so this is, some, this is another kind of indication of the kind of chaos of the typical pathway through community college. This shows you the, the, the distribution of the number of credits students have who act when they transfer. So we think they take two years, they get 60 credits, an associate's degree, and they transfer and become a junior. That's, what, that's kind of the way the thing is designed. That's not what happens. That, that, the, the, the second spike is more or less where that is. So there are some students doing that. Many students take one or two courses and then they transfer. And there's students out there with 100 or more than 100 credits in, in, before they transfer with, when an associate's degree is supposed to be 60 credits. Most of those credits, many of the 60, won't transfer, but certainly the ones over 60 are unlikely to transfer as well. So these are just pictures of uh, the complexity of these systems and the, the way that students try to work their way through that. All right, so why do, they, why do students drift in this way? Insufficient advising, it's usually one in a thousand, so you can't have a system based on individual advising. Catalogs are difficult to understand. All of these things I've kind of gone through cannot enroll in required classes. There are actually bureaucratic uh, barriers to that. They don't understand the course sequence or the course sequencing, course withdrawals, repeats, and failures, and changing majors late in, late in career. So these are all types of things that knock students off the path, and you can see hardly any of them actually stay on that path that's originally designed. <laughs> So students are mostly on their own. That's kind of been a theme that we've had. They're on their own, 10 minutes with an advisor in this extremely complicated and complex environment. They don't have clear goals. They may lack, and in many cases, it's, their parents haven't been to college. Their brothers aren't in college. Uh, their advisors in high school haven't, uh, you know, aren't able to help them in that way. So they don't have that kind of backup. And of course, if they make mistakes, they also tend to not have the uh, financial and other types of resources that will allow them to, to absorb those kinds of mistakes. So here's, a, here's a, a quote from a student we talked to. I still don't know what I'm doing. Honestly, I'm taking classes all on my own. I have no idea what basic courses you have to take, your prerequisites. The advisor couldn't tell me because apparently they all, they're all different for whatever you want to go. So not much help. Complex, not very much preparation. All right, so what is being done about this? And I think this area, the, the ones that we've heard before, before at this session, where there have been more research and more well-defined uh, outcomes, but there are some things which are being done. And this is uh, done at a, Florida in, in a, a college in Florida. And so this is a problem. Students couldn't enroll in courses, so they built a system to try to get out of the way of the students so that you couldn't actually, it, was, it wasn't impossible to actually uh, go through the course and uh, the, the program in the way it was done. And you, you can see that had a relatively small uh, 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 improvement in what they did. Then they, students lacked a clear path, so they were confused. So they introduced maps, so it was easy, much simplified courses to go through. Uh, to go through college. So there was a slight improvement in retention and graduation, but there was no reduction in excess hours in, ex in all of those excess courses that students were taking. So finally, students, couldn't, uh, students continued to take courses that were not on the map. So they ad added milestone courses which hold on, withhold on registration and required students to select an area of interest or major upon entering. So they gave them the information, they gave a simplified structure, and here they put some sorts of requirements on it. So we talked before about incentives. These are strong incentives. Uh, this is straight out of behavioral economics. Uh, you can give them this pathway, you make them take that. If they don't want it, they can change it, but to do that, they have to come and talk to the council. So it's the other way around. Here's your program. If you don't do anything, this is what you're going to do. If you don't like it, come and talk to me and give me a reason. So you can see there was a six percentage point increase in retention rate, almost 70, 17 point increase in four year graduation rates. So this is one uh, model that's, that's being used. And there's some, there, there are places that are doing this kind of Florida State. This is where this, was, uh, this example came from. There are other, these are other uh, uh, institutions, both, both two-year and four-year, that are trying to build these more structured uh, career, uh, program maps and putting some kind of 
uh, requirements on that so that students actually take it. Um, as far as rigorous research is concerned, the best thing so far is probably the ASAP program, which was evaluated using a random assignment uh, uh, designed by uh, MDRC. You can see this has many of those features in it. It does have a, a more structured uh, pathway, but this, I, I really think of this as a very intensive counseling program where there's a lot of required counseling and one of the goals that they have is kind of a triage method, which is to say, can we identify the students who actually need the one-on-one -on -one counseling? And the other ones can be served either by group counseling and in some cases by, uh, by, by electronic uh, information. So, so these were positive outcomes when they did this. This, this has actually uh, 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 attracted a lot of attention. There was articles in the New York Times and other types of things. So there's a lot of excitement about this. So just actually, I wish I had uh, Bridget's last slide there because I think those are basically the same, the same lessons. You can simplify the structure and make it more coherent. That's what's being done. I think in addition to that, though, in these cases, some kind of requirement, that is, it's not purely voluntary, that's one thing. You can additionally provide more information with, with uh, better, inf better information, better analytics, which uh, allows you to track students, which allows students to know where they are, which allows you to know when they've fallen off that course. And then in the end, indeed, there are students who will continue to need one-on-one -on -one counseling. So hopefully through those other mechanisms, you've been able to identify those so that you can more strategically use the limited resources you have for counseling for the students who need it most. Thank you. All right. So I'd make a joke about the room, but I don't think you could see me or hear me. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to uh, really try to, to summarize a bit of what, what I heard today uh, and hopefully what, what we've all uh, learned from this fantastic panel. Uh, first, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Jack Buckley, uh, I'm in charge of research at the College Board, and I'll come back to why, why I'm here uh, in a few minutes. But before I do that, I actually just like to point out something. Uh, so we've got a very modest panel here in the sense of this is a very important topic, uh, and there are folks here. So a lot of times you, you, you may wander in for the rest of this week, you'll wander into a panel and it'll also be a very important topic and people will be making uh, very astute observations about that topic. Uh, in, in this case, the people here are the people that are helping to shape federal, state, and institutional policies about this topic. Uh, you know, last night, to refresh my memory on Pell, I read the CBO piece from a few years back that goes through the financial details and most of these people are thanked for reviewing it or writing it or contributing to it. These are the, the people that the rest of us are trying to learn from to figure out uh, how to improve this problem. And it's a great privilege to, to be here with you and have you all together in, in one place. And I just want to point that out in case some of you maybe don't know uh, where you wandered into. So I will, as I said, uh, talk a bit about what, uh, what we learned, hopefully. Tell you uh, why the College Board has anything to do with this and then think, hopefully, uh, we'll turn it over to you and we can think about where do we go next. So Bridget's piece uh, really frames the problem uh, for me as, as one of navigating complex processes. Uh, and in this case, of course, particularly with high stakes. Uh, in, in the policy world right now, uh, either levels of government or for large nonprofits or foundations, um, there's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of excitement about sort of informational treatments, some idea that I can provide uh, some, some quantum of information, uh, in this case to, to students, usually perhaps to families, households, uh, that will, at low cost to the provider, uh, really give this nice bump uh, in terms of the outcomes that we want. That'll be easy to scale, right? So if you're a large uh, nonprofit corporation like mine, uh, you hear something like this, it's sort of discrete chunks and I know how to do it and I can deliver it and I can drop it off with these folks and it'll be done and I see a, an impact and that's exactly what we want. It's a, a simple system to understand. And as all the uh, papers today prove, uh, but as we should know from anything in experience, it's not sufficient usually. It's, you, you might get an improvement, but it's not going to be enough to solve the problem. And the problem here, of course, is getting kids into college and getting them uh, not just to access, but actually persistence and attainment 
and particularly uh, you know, under, underserved uh, kids that may not otherwise have an opportunity. So what do we do? If you've got a, a system that's too complex for simple treatments, there's really only two things we can do. We can make the system simpler, and that's one of the themes uh, today. So are, are there any ways to uh, take some of the complexity out of the system? The, the FAFSA work, of course, is something that if you don't already know about, uh, you should. This is, uh, you, you can't walk into a discussion in education policy in Washington without people talking about this, uh, probably because they're people who just looked at the FAFSA and maybe hadn't seen it before in a long time and had no idea how complicated it was until they showed up there. Uh, but the fact also that there's a real impact here, right? When you can find ways to simplify that process and, and lower that bar or, or that hurdle, uh, we see uh, serious impact in improvement. But also, as, as we heard uh, in Bridges' paper and, and more uh, in some of the others today, we can also make our treatments a little bit more complicated. Maybe it's not sufficient just to drop off uh, some information from 40,000 feet. And so, uh, you know, again, probably should not come as a surprise. We may need to uh, have somewhat lab more labor-intensive uh, interactions with students that we're trying to help. We may need to spend more time uh, actually guiding them or their families. We may need to provide uh, resources more than a, a one-off uh, quick delivery. And one of the other uh, themes here, of course, is we may be able to use technology to amplify what we're doing. So it, it may not be uh, all, it'll be lab more labor intensive, but it also may be uh, mediated by new forms of technology. The early college uh, planning initiative results, the, the, just the little teaser of them that you showed us was, was fantastic. I mean, you, you can live your whole life doing research and never see uh, an effect size like that. And so we're certainly, uh, I can say on, on behalf of, of the, my company, that we'll be looking at that to figure out if, if that scales or if we can work with that. Sandy, to, to turn to your paper, so you know, speaking of complexity, uh, it doesn't get really more complex than, than Pell. And I thought you made a really good point in there that, you know, we call it a program, and in some governmenty sense it's a program, but it isn't really. It's a voucher, and it doesn't have all the scaffolding around it that a real program would have. It's a, in this case, we're not just sort of dumping information on people. We're dumping a, you know, a check on people and walking away and saying, good luck with that. Hope you figure out how to go to college and, and get through. Uh, and, as you point out, it's not just one type of person, one type of student. Uh, I think, you know, the, the media uh, don't help us with this. A lot of folks, uh, if you've been through a four-year college, when someone talks about college students, you think immediate entrant, traditional student in a four-year degree granting program. And as anybody that studied post-secondary education knows, that's not the modal student. And even for Pell, there are several populations being served. And I think it's really important always to keep that in mind because solutions uh, that may solve for one part of Pell uh, population-wise may not at all cover uh, the others. And you, you propose uh, here and, and elsewhere, I think I was even at that, that Hamilton uh, uh, presentation where you talked about this before, um, you know, several promising innovations. Again, around simplification of this process. Can we determine uh, eligibility automatically? Can we fix that in place so you don't have to reapply? Uh, should we provide additional guidance? Uh, can we consider other incentives? And, and the per credit funding is a really powerful idea too. And as you mentioned, a lot of people are, are very interested in that. Or we could just implement Ryan's plan from this week and just freeze it, make it discretionary, and set a cap on it that we don't know what it is, and uh, and just sort of wind it down. So no one, of course, is taking that proposal particularly seriously, but it does reflect the fact that there is not a consensus uh, at the federal level on on first of all how broken, in what way Pell is broken, and how it should be fixed. And we should, we'll come back to the policy environment. Ben and Lindsay, so this is another exciting uh, line of research as well. It's something that, of course, uh, some of you were just visiting College Board recently, and, and we've been working with you to, to figure out what you're doing, and again, how can we scale it? Um, I think in, until you've been exposed to this research, you may not have any idea about the size of, of summer melt as you define it. So not the traditional definition, but as you define it, that, that you know, in the areas that they've studied between some 20 to maybe upwards of 40 percent of college intending graduates uh, actually fail to matriculate. So why? Again, the same sort of factors. We've got finance, you know, unexpected costs, which is a real piece of this, but also this complexity. And as I read, uh, you, you know, looking through your work, uh, both this piece and, and some of the other papers, I, I kept thinking back, you know, again, I, I didn't bring any data today, but I brought anecdotes, so, you know, that's, that's something. 
Um, you know, I, I kept thinking back to my own uh, college experience, like, oh, how hard can this be? And then remembering, uh, even after three years of, of undergraduate, uh, I missed all the deadlines to, to enroll in an honors thesis and had to go beg to figure it out because nobody advised me I didn't know how to do it. And I used to wait every year to see whether or not you'd actually be able to register because I never knew if I did everything right. And that's always when I had the resources to go call somebody usually and get over that hurdle, but it was still difficult. And you realize how difficult uh, it can be for, for a broader range of students. And uh, if you didn't get it from the slides earlier, they're testing rigorously uh, some, some very exciting interventions that have uh, very strong uh, results. And so we're looking again at uh, methods of advising, of peer mentoring, whether that be on the college side or, or before the wall on the high school side, and uh, starting to turn us again towards, towards introducing technology. Uh, and there's a lot of talk again about sort of personalized text. There are some other, uh, some, there's even a for-profit company that provides us as a service to, uh, to LEAs. Um, and people are, of course, digging into social media uh, as, as another way of potentially delivering these reminders and these nudges that, hey, you're about to miss a deadline where you need to do something to move on. I think the most interesting finding, though, of the, if you were, even if you were already aware of, of a lot of their work, uh, the, the part I didn't realize until uh, reviewing it again last night was that impact not only on enrollment but on persistence, right? And, and that's, a, you know, that's a, really the, the holy grail. If you can do something that is relatively scalable and not only get kids in the door but it actually helps keep them there, uh, any of the interventions we've looked at or talked about here today, that's, that's exactly what we're looking for. So Tom, right, so two-year college, how, how complicated can that be? Um, this has got to be the easy part, right? Well, not, not if you know anything at all about uh, the trajectory of kids through two-year institutions. And if you didn't, you saw it on that slide today, there are more ways uh, to, to get through or not uh, through a two-year degree program than there are seats in this auditorium, literally, if you look at that, that slide. Uh, why is that? Again, complexity. You've got sort of uh, weird path dependence of accreting programs and requirements and not much ever goes away, but they layer some more stuff on or somebody comes in and makes a few changes, but they keep most of what was there. There's an enormous range of choices, you know, bigger than all but the largest four-year universities in terms of what you can and, and must decide to do. And unfortunately, some of these most complex institutions have the fewest resources to help students, and in many cases, the students who need the most assistance, those, uh, you know, their first generation college students with few uh, family or friends to fall back on in terms of a social network to help them navigate the problem. But again, uh, Tom points out here, some families of effective reform, some interventions that actually uh, are proven to work. He mentioned uh, on that slide a few moments ago the demand analysis to help ensure that there are enough open sections to actually cover key prerequisites that kids need or adults need. Uh, actually mapping out the concentrations or majors in some of these very complex areas so you've got something you can hold and look at and keep with you and maybe show your advisor who probably in that thousand to one ratio may not know as much as you do if you've got a decent map uh, depending on how they're trained and how long they've been there. And even that, as, as he mentioned, wasn't enough, but luckily uh, through, again, rigorous experimentation, we found some milestone course uh, concepts that actually keep people on that map. That are not just, you can't just give somebody a map, you've got to actually make sure that, that, that they're following it. Um, so again, with, with the uh, challenges that, that our two-year institutions are facing, clearly uh, we need structured tools like these to help simplify the process for students. All right, so, so what do, you know, why am I here? Uh, College Board, you may know us from uh, some favorites like the SAT or uh, the AP classes you took in, in high school, uh, but you also may not be as aware, we have a major uh, company-wide initiative that we're calling right now Access to Opportunity or our an internal jargon A2O, because that's faster to say, that's faster to type. Our Access to Opportunity initiative uh, essentially the, the, the idea is to find interventions like these, like the ones that, that you heard about today, where there's evidence of effectiveness uh, that are actually getting kids uh, over, or adults over various hurdles in the college going process, uh, and that are scalable, 
and figure out ways to actually deliver them at scale uh, to populations that need them. So we are uh, committing a, a large amount of, of corporate resources to actually trying to solve this problem, which is why we uh, folks on our staff have worked with not just researchers like these, but these very researchers in many cases to actually try to identify uh, what they're doing and figure out whether or not we can, we can implement it at scale or help them uh, do further experimentation to, to learn what else might work. Of the, it's a relatively new program. Of course, we have a, a new CEO who's only been in there a little over a year. Um, the, the particular piece of A2O that's gotten the most attention uh, is called Realize Your College Potential, which is a, a pilot initiative that sends packets of customized information plus fee waivers for college application fees to high-achieving, low-income high school seniors. Uh, but I do want to make it clear that that's not sort of the only thing th that we do in this area. And, and uh, you know, if, if we weren't already looking in new directions after uh, listening to a panel like this, we certainly would be. You know, there's some things that we've done that are just informational for a long time. Uh, they've had varying ranges of success. But if you didn't get the point from this uh, panel already, just providing information is unlikely to be enough. Um, we also not only provide some uh, resources and information to uh, students, but also to counselors. These are just a few of the, uh, the various other programs that we do. Um, but clearly they're not enough. And so, you know, we, uh, listening to, to researchers like the ones that we've all been listening to today, we realize that these more complex problems actually need richer interventions, dimensions of guidance of mentoring, of providing information through multiple channels, uh, perhaps incentives. Um, you know, Bridget, one of your interesting findings there again was the power of the incentive coupled with the information and the assistance. Uh, so we are uh, engaged right now in reviewing, actually planning for our next cohort of kids, sort of our, our class of 15 crowd and, and beyond to try to tackle more of these obstacles. And so we'll be looking at, I, I encourage you, uh, you know, always looking for partners that have scalable programs that are backed by rigorous evidence, uh, but also are sensitive to the realities of the policy context in which they operate. It's very hard to move one of these levers at once without understanding uh, what else is going on. And so I uh, thank you all for the opportunity to, to listen to you again today. Great. Great. Um, well, we have a little bit of time for uh, more of a discussion, Q&A. Because they are streaming this session and, and recording it, um, I've been asked to ask you um, one, I hope you do have questions, um, but if you, if you do want to ask a question, there's a microphone um, right there, there's a microphone right there, so if you'd actually um, go to the microphone to ask your question um, so that both the question and the responses can be recorded. to figure in the travel time. That's right. <laughs> so I had a question. I was also struck by the finding um, regarding persistence um, and was curious whether you had any hypothesis about why that was. On the summer melt research yes, in particular. On the summer melt research. Great, thanks. Um, so it's a it's a great question, and, and it's something that we did um, put a lot of thought into. So um, one thing that I said just as an offhand comment was this idea of starting smarter, that um, we heard we heard many stories of students um, starting starting college but not having their finances in order to be able to buy their books or um, having at very late dates um, still needing to organize their housing if they are living away from home during college. And so um, one thing that we hypothesize is maybe those students are um, able able to start college in sort of a calmer demeanor that they're actually ready to take on um, rigorous academic work because some of those other life issues or, or sort of um, logistical issues are out of the way. Um, I think that's one thing. Another thing, as we were designing the intervention, um, we should have noted one of the organizations that we worked with is a, a fabulous nonprofit organization called You Aspire, headquartered in uh, the Boston area, but they really are working on a national presence right now. And uh, we worked very closely with their advisors in, in designing the intervention, and their, their advisors felt very strongly that what they didn't want to be doing was um, having students come in with their confusing paperwork 
and sit there while the advisor filled out the paperwork on their behalf. That they really wanted to um, build the capacity in students to be able to do take those kinds of steps on their own. And when they realized that they needed help or didn't understand something, that they would be empowered to actually go out and, and seek help. And so um, another, another hypothesis is that um, even a few hours of um, support, if it's not done in, in kind of a paternalistic um, way, if it's actually skill building in the student, that um, the student may be better able and more capable of handling those kinds of tasks, important tasks, um, in, in the future. Is there anything uh, you would want to if I could add something, yeah, yeah I, I think this is something that comes out of Ben and Lindsay's work with Summer Melt, but even in my FAFSA project, we had these persistence results. I think there's been this myth that if students aren't in college, well, they just didn't have the academic chops. Or if you study issues of persistence and attrition in college, you know, the first theory is that, well, academically they weren't prepared, they must have been failing out. And what you quickly find out is that's true for some subset, but there are all these other issues that uh, cause students to stop out of school. And so what I think we're finding with some of these is we have these processes and barriers built um, that are not the, the skills in order to get over those barriers are not the skills necessary to actually do well in college. There's these kind of unwritten, unofficial rules and they're not quite sure why they're there. You know, why would filling out the FAFSA be a good test for whether or not you can study, you know, and do well in Bio 101? Um, and the same thing with, with Summer Melt. And so I think that's part of um, what, you know, a lot of papers are starting to show that, yes, there are these barriers there, but they're not the right ones to judge whether or not a student can excel academically, get their coursework done, and, and so forth. I would just add one other thing. I think there's a, um, a misperception sometimes when we present about the Summer Melt work that, that challenges with these summer tasks are something that only low-income and first-generation students struggle with, and that students from more affluent backgrounds can handle all this stuff very seamlessly. And in fact, what we find in our research is that the main difference is that students from more affluent backgrounds also tend to have college-educated parents who are tremendously involved in the college process and providing a lot of guidance and direction and pestering and follow-up to make sure that their high school graduates are not goofing off and are attending to these summer tasks. Um, and so I, I think to build on the point Bridget made, there um, the, these complex problems and these complex tasks are challenging for people in general, for adolescents in particular, given their stage of cognitive development. What differentiates, I think, often low-income and first-generation students is not a lack of tenacity or resourcefulness or, per, or persistence to complete these tasks, but rather the lack of family or school-based support that, that students from more affluent backgrounds are able to depend on to uh, proceed through these tasks. These are all really great papers, and so thank you so much for, um, uh, for everything that you've presented. Uh, one question that I had, and I imagine that many of you, many of the programs and interventions you have, have this as some component of the discussion, um, but the papers today focused heavily on the FAFSA in particular, and an issue that uh, a lot of us know about is that many low-income students um, and even first-generation college, middle-income students oftentimes will rely on or expect scholarships to magically appear and not even think about uh, financial aid. And so I wonder, especially since a lot of these interventions are information-oriented, to what extent debunking that myth and um, helping students understand that that financial aid is a necessary part of the process um, and that scholarships are not necessarily a, a realistic place for them to go unless they're in that you know, very upper echelon of um, the most high achieving and also viewable um, uh, students. Um, you know, how the, how the scholarship piece fits in with the FAFSA piece because it, it seems to be something that a lot of students don't really talk about. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think, you know, our, a lot of our work ends up touching on the FAFSA because we've realized just what a barrier it is and it connects so much of the system. Um, but I think your question is really about this is a process. We, we don't want to just wait until spring of senior year. And so the early college planning initiative is getting more at the 7th to 10th grade kind of level. And it's a conversation not just about college savings, but kind of how the system works. We're not going to go into the ins and outs of the FAFSA, but there should be some awareness that it's there and kind of what the steps are. And we have 
have, we spent um, an important part of the workshop going through kind of myths and realities um, and so forth because this idea, you know, there's grants and there's scholarships and it isn't just the top 1% that get scholarships, but it is a, mo a lot more complicated and that's when we're getting to the need for more personalized information. So this, these questions that I've kind of been thinking a bit about is, you know, what we can do that is general information and then what can we do to try to empower families to follow up and think about their own personal um, circumstances. And I think um, Ben and Lindsay, in talking a bit about their work and kind of talking a bit about other projects, you know, we've been working together and hoping to get some work that goes earlier in the pipeline, um, also working with the college board. Um, so earlier information, earlier um, barriers and stages and steps and things that you need to know along the way. Because as one of my slides showed, you know, the pipeline is like 30 different questions, problems, tasks that you need to do at the right time in the right order and the right way. Um, so yeah, we've been thinking a lot about interventions that are, you know, earlier, whether it's text messaging or matching with counselors or other things. I think your question is also interesting because um, we have many problems resulting from the kind of journalism that um, is uh, dominating our world these days. But this is one of them because I think in an effort to sort of say, you know, there's money under a rock, go look for everything. There are a lot of articles about how there was all the scholarship money being left on the table. And obviously there is some, but it's not very much. Uh, there is, of course, the barrier that some people don't want to give out the personal information that would be on the FAFSA, so it's not just that they don't know about it. Um, but, but also I think, like, even the information, the sort of um, the idea that's out there that the money's going to rich kids now. Um, may make people discouraged about looking for financial aid. And of course, that's not true at all. I mean, there, obviously, when you fill out the FAFSA, most of the money from the FAFSA is absolutely going to go to low income students. But again, it, we have to figure out how to provide information and get people to access information appropriately, recognizing the really information with which they're being bombarded, which is less accurate. And, and that, I think, is a real challenge. We can't, we can't prevent that from happening. And I would, uh, Jack touched on this briefly in, in talking about the college board's work on realizing your college potential, but whether and how much students owe on top of their financial aid is, is going to depend a lot on where they've applied and been accepted. And that we, have, we in these papers didn't talk as much about the college um, match issue, but, but certainly the college board has been a real pioneer in this, along with people like Carolyn Hoxby and Sarah Turner. Um, because in fact, schools that, especially for high achieving low income students, schools that have the highest list price may actually offer a lower net price when you factor in their institutional aid on top of federal and state grant aid. And so I think to, your, to the broader point of your question of how, to, how do students um, find a quality post-secondary option that is affordable, I think a lot of it, as Bridget alluded to, and again, as I think the College Board is taking a real lead in this area, um, is a function of, of where they apply and as, as related to that, what kind of information and assistance they have in identifying and applying to colleges that are well matched to their abilities and interests. I wanted to add a comment around the topic of simplification <clears throat> because I've, um, I've worked with uh, Shomon Shamsuddin, who's at MIT, who just completed um, a study that included a qualitative piece in which he interviewed college counselors, college career core counselors, and lots of interviews with low-income students in the Boston area. And one of the things he found that was so surprising was that for many of these students, they don't see a GPA on a transcript until senior year. And prior to that, they don't know how to compute a GPA. And they also don't understand the relationship between GPA and the kinds of colleges they can get to. So it seemed to us that this was a relatively easy fix that somehow is sort of fallen through the cracks. And I wondered if you had ever come across something like this in any of your work. Yeah, I think this is a question about 
what information are schools communicating to students? And you have heard this. This is not just an issue in Boston, but I do remember from studies that, you know, students get free tuition or, or things like that if you're the top 10 percent, which you don't find out if you're the top 10 percent until the very last second to know, you know, whether or not this is going to be the case. And so these, these questions about what can schools communicate to students and how they communicate to them and then what do you do with that information I think is, is a really um, big one. Um, so you know, there's certainly different things that student, that schools could push out to students, but a thing you have to be careful with um, with that and some other work I've seen in trying to give like early placement testing and give students a sense of whether or not they're going to be ready for college level math or if they should take more math when they're in high school. A really important part of that is the implementation. So if you're going to give students information, what counseling and assistance goes along with that to help them interpret it and make better decisions or react to it and those types of things. So if you get information that your GPA is really, really low, we hope that there would then be, how do we think about um, you know, bolstering your skills, making different decisions, what kind of supports do you need, if we need to help you raise your GPA, you know, what's going on that's um, ha causing you to struggle. So. With a lot of these kinds of information, things that we've been talking about, it's also important to have the interpretation, the counseling, the kind of proactive, what do we do with this to help improve um, your chances of success? So it seems like we've exhausted our uh, questions for right now. Um, of course, um, I think we'll be able to um, stick around. So if anybody um, wants to chat more informally, um, of course, we're glad to. And otherwise, thank you again for taking the time to join us. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.